This week on Q&A, our guest is Ted Leonsis, author of the new book, The Business of Happiness. He's also an entrepreneur and owner of several Washington, D.C. professional sports teams. He produces films, including the documentary Nanking. Ted Leonsis, you tell a story in your book about Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, and Allen Ginsberg. Would you recount that for us? Uh, well, my family grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, and uh, a lot of French Canadians also came to Lowell to work in the mill towns. And the Kerouac family and my mother's family became very, very close. And I ended up a student here at Georgetown University, wrote a thesis on Jack Kerouac, and Ginsburg came to town with William Burroughs. And I met them and ended up taking the class with me and <coughs> hanging out with them. Who? <coughs> For those that have never heard of all three, tell us more about Jack Kerouac and his, uh, and his book. Jack Kerouac was, um, wrote a best-selling book, very influential book, called On the Road. On the Road really started the beat generation, kind of a countercultural look at the world. Kerouac was a disaffected youth, went to Columbia University, and while he was there, he met Allen Ginsberg. Ginsberg wrote a very seminally important book called Howl. Um, the, the probably the most famous poem of the 60s, and the two of them became very, very good friends. How about William Burroughs? Uh, William Burroughs, also a great writer, um, and the three of them really became celebrities in their own right, not just for their writing, but for the lifestyle that they were trying to create. You had, in the New York music scene, you had jazz and the beats, and they really were the precursors, if you will, to maybe the the free love hippie movement in the 60s. And how did you meet those two guys? Uh, they were here giving a, um, a lecture at the Folger Library, and I went over and told them that I had some family relations with Kerouac. They had become estranged uh, from the Kerouac family, and they thought that they could get closer to the family by uh, being nice to me. And so they sat for a couple of days' worth of interviews, and it really helped me. Uh, it also was a lot of fun bringing him into the Georgetown radio station and having Allen Ginsberg read Howell and also do some transcendental meditation on air. Well, it struck me that you have a lot of lessons that you're teaching in your book, but it struck me that you went out of your way I mean, this is a lesson to find these two guys. I mean, did you think that they would come with you to class or that they would? No, I think in anything in life, it was an early lesson that a lot of times if you just ask, people will say yes. And there was a case where um, um, I wanted to get a good grade. I wanted to do really good primary research. And so I maybe went a little above and beyond the call of duty and went to a poetry reading and hung around afterwards and introduced myself. And sometimes you just never know uh, unless you ask, uh, you'll probably get a yes. What were you studying overall at Georgetown? Uh, American studies uh, and foreign service were my two concentrations. And how did you end up there? Um, well, it's a strange story because neither my mom and dad went to college. Um, I never visited the campus. A guy whose lawn I mowed was a Georgetown graduate, and he knew I was fastidious with how I mowed his lawn, and we became friends. And he asked me, where was I going to apply to college? And I said, I, I really didn't know. And he served a bit as a mentor to me and helped me to get into the university. Did you ever have a goal of making a lot of money? Um, I didn't. Um, I, I didn't know that I was poor until I came to Georgetown. I, my dad was a waiter. My mom was a secretary. And I think between them, the best year they ever had was $28,000. And so when did that, I mean, one of the reasons you wrote the book is tell us the story of you were 13 years with American, America Online, made a lot of money. Yep. When did that start? When did you feel that? Um, well, I was an entrepreneur right out of college. Uh, a couple of years uh, into my career, I started my first company. It was a publishing company. And I raised some venture capital and was very fortunate. I sold it to International Thompson. Now, Thompson Reuters for $65 million. And at a very, very young age, I, I came into a lot of money. And um, I was kind of programmed, if you work really, really hard and you're successful and you make a lot of money, then you would feel successful and you would be happy. And what the book really is positing is that if you're happy, you can be successful. But if you're successful, you're not necessarily happy. That first company was called List. 
Right. What it's, did it stand for? It was the Leonsis Index to Software Technology. It was a database online company uh, started in 1982 around the launch of the IBM PC and it looked like a TV guide. Uh, the front of the book was interviews with software executives like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs and the back of the book was a directory of what software worked on what hardware and really kind of was a precursor to Today, it would be a website like a Yahoo that had a directory of everything that you needed to find very easily organized. What did you sell that company for? How much? I sold it for $65 million. Um, and after taxes, I made $20 million bucks and I declared victory. I have great empathy for my players now. You know, young, young people like Alexander Ovechkin, we just signed him to a 12-year, $125 million deal, and, and you're not really prepared for what no, notoriety and, and a big paycheck will bring to you. And what I found is that I kind of lost my way a little bit, and then I got on the wrong airplane, and the airplane developed all sorts of mechanical difficulties, and you know we prepared for a crash landing. And it was really kind of the big pivotal moment in my life. Uh, first, you always read about people dying with a smile on their face and around the plane no one was smiling. Everyone was weeping and crying or praying. And so I have a high level of faith, but I thought it was inauthentic if I just prayed. So I started to negotiate and I literally said, um, it'll be a good deal if you let me live. I promise that if I get a second chance, I'll I'll leave more than I take, and I'll play offense with the rest of my life, and I'll, I'll try to be additive. I won't just be a taker. And obviously, I made it through. And that following weekend, I sat down to say, okay, well, I got a do-over. I got the second chance. What do I do? And, and I didn't have any tools available to me. And I knew I had had a reckoning. I had had this big pivot in my life. So I ended up making this list of 101 things to do before I die. And it's been a guiding force. It helped me to envision a lot of the twists and turns that my life uh, positively have taken. But it also put me on the path and road to being a student of happiness. And right down the street is where my journey started at the Library of Congress. You go and you read online in a digital format the uh, Declaration of Independence. And, uh, you know, it was redlined and blacklined. It had lots of edits. And the only sentence that wasn't edited, that had no added value by the, any of the founding fathers, was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's, it's in our DNA as a country. It's in our genetics as people. It's, if you think about it, it's what religion sells. Yet as students, as business people, we're not programmed to think about a quest for happiness and self-actualization. But when I uh, picked your book up, read your book uh, on all that, trying to figure out <clears throat> you and your background, there's some mixed messages here, so you, you clear it up. Sure. Us. First, it's published by Regnery, which is a well-known conservative publisher. You got help in writing this from John Buckley, who worked for Ronald Reagan, worked for uh, the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee. But if I had just read your book, I and it's also endorsed by Maria Shriver and Don Graham and... Uh, Chris Wallace and some others, I would have guessed you were a liberal. So fill in the blanks here. How does all this fit together? You know, I've never put a label on myself. I, I'm fiscally conservative. Um, I'm a bootstrap entrepreneur. My father was first generation from Greece. I truly believe in the American dream. I, I think I embody some of it that, that you know, I ended up owning, owning sports teams. I ended up taking companies public. I've, I've done well, and I, I believe that the economy and capitalism is at the heart of what makes America great. At the same time, I realize that being happy, really the biggest part of it is being an active participant in communities of interest and volunteering and giving back and having social awareness are equally as important. So I guess I'd say I'm fiscally very conservative, but I'm socially progressive. I also noticed that you gave money to both John McCain and Barack Obama. Yeah, I gave them both. And, and it was interesting when, when John and I were working on the book. And John Buckley. John Buckley. And we put out the formula of what makes for 
success through happiness, um, it was right during the primaries. And we wrote down each of the candidates to say who scored the highest. And based on the formula, Obama scored the highest. He had high levels of self-expression. He was a community activist. He, he um, showed great empathy. He was always looking at what the higher calling of the position was. And so, so that started to lead us to it isn't just about personal happiness, that companies that are happy, that campaigns that are happy and pursue this formula, they end up getting the accrual of the highest levels of value. So the front of the book is a personal journey book, but the back of the book really talks about how businesses, like a Google as an example, I wrote a story last week in Newsweek about how Google withdrew from China. And when you, you listened, all of the experts and Wall Street analysts said, you can't leave China. China's the fourth biggest um, internet market. It'll soon be the biggest internet market. It's the world's biggest emerging economy. It's bad business. But Sergey said, I really don't want to be, Sergey Brin, who's the, one of the co-founders of the company, said, I can't be happy knowing that someone's reading emails and arresting students. I can't be happy knowing that they want to come in and crash into my network and steal, you know, trade secrets. And so he pulled out, he did the right thing the right way, and the morale of the company went up, and you watch, their business will get even stronger. There's a lot we can talk about because there are a lot of different things that you're involved in. One of the things, that before we get to your documentary productions that you have, I want to show you a clip of you and an American Society of Newspaper Editors meeting in about 13 years ago and bring us up to date on your thinking from then to now. Okay. In the future, editors are going to be bartenders. I think. I know that's a terrible thing to say in that what the role of a editor or will be social media. It'll be, I'm bringing you into a place, into a bar. I'm going to give you the news. I'm going to bring other people around that'll talk to you about the news. I'll find dissenting voices and I'll package that up for you. That's a great new position and job. Well, that's it, a lousy description of what a society ought to be, I think. I think that uh, we're, you know, look at the, the Pulitzer Prizes and look at what the Seattle Times did with its investigation on the 747 rudders and so on. How the hell is that going to happen on the internet? I mean, that's a reporter. I mean, I don't know those people, but it's a reporter who took months working on a story like that when the biggest industry in town, Boeing, was saying this guy is not credible, the paper's irresponsible, all those things produce wonderful work that's going to have major impact on all of us. But how does that stuff happen well, online if we just pretend we're bartenders? That's an old video of you 13 years ago talking to Ron Martin, who was the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. What were you doing in 1997? Uh, well, I was president of America Online and was really an evangelist for this new medium and how it would level the playing field and bring education and democracy to a very wide audience and I just believed and you know I was using terminology 13 years ago which is very relevant today. Um, Google and Facebook and Twitter really are the platforms for the new consumer. I think the newspaper that he was referencing is no longer in business. There's 167 newspapers that are in chapter 11 uh, proceedings right now and, and a part of the reason is that I've always felt that some media uh, viewed themselves as high priests. Um, you know, he was offended by the concept of, of being a bartender. And, and what I meant by that, I was using Sam Malone at Cheers, which was a big show at the time, where Sam really would activate discussion. And that's really what news and information does. It informs you, but it also allows you to activate your social awareness and discussion points with family members and friends. What were the 13 years that you were at uh, America Online? Um, I got to AOL in 1993 and just retired at the end of 06. And the team you referred to earlier is the Washington Capitals uh, hockey team. And how long have you owned them? Um, I've owned the Washington Capitals and the Mystics for about a dozen years. And I own 44% of the Verizon Center right around the corner from here as well as the Washington Wizards. And the Mystics are? Mystics are the WNBA women's basketball team. And how are they doing? Uh, they made the playoffs last year. We have a good team. The Caps finished first in the NHL during 
the regular season, and now we're into the playoffs. Let me go back to that session 13 years ago with another clip and get your reaction to this. I think there's a defensiveness sometimes in newspapers themselves that brings some of this up. It, it's not going out of business. They're, they, you know, television didn't go out of business with cable. Right? But I will tell you that 10 years ago I sat in a conference in a meeting like this where Ted Turner was on and there were some broadcast network executives and they were saying, this isn't journalism. This isn't going to work. This is chicken noodle network. You know, it's spending too much money. It's not making any money. And Time, Mag Time, uh, the Time Corporate offered $5 million for it, right? And, and didn't do it. And now they paid $7 billion for it. And it's the place where on television, news is defined. Now, this is just a matter of do you embrace do you push away? Newspapers are not going out of business. There is a way to take your core competencies and move up the value chain in this new medium. How are you doing 13 years later? Well, I was wrong. They are going out of business, and I wish they had listened a little bit more aggressively to move more aggressively, more quickly into the new media. Uh, you know, newspapers just now are starting to get more active in blogging. They're just now starting to realize the importance of video. They're really trying to embrace that all of their consumers um, aren't reading printed paper. Um, and, you know, it, prices have gone up for gas. Uh, unions charge too much money. And, 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 What's ironic is that the free product, you know, I'm a, I'm a subscriber to the Washington Post and I joke with Don Graham about this all the time, their free product on the web is better than the product that I pay for in newspaper form, right? I get the newspaper in the morning, it doesn't get updated, it's mostly black and white, it gets my hands dirty. I go on their website, I have video, I have audio, it's updated all the time. And, and so, so that the genie's out of the bottle, this new media, because of bandwidth, because of Moore's Law, because of the amount of investment that's been made in infrastructure on the internet, it's just, it just was a matter of time before the new media really became the primary media and that, that newspapers now really are aside and kind of behind what's happened. The, the area of your book where you're the most critical is the whole business of the merger with time. Now, <clears throat> give us the time frame again. What year did Steve Case and Jerry Levin get together with the merger? 1999. And, you know, in, in my book, you'll note that I say the fifth tenant for happiness is finding the higher calling um, and knowing the mission that your company or you personally are on. And at AOL, when we were a standalone company, our mission really was um, bringing democracy around the world, introducing the magic of interactivity to, you know, the largest audience possible. We wanted to get America online. And then we acquired Time Warner, and our mission became $11 billion of profit. We used to always obsess and worry about how happy 250 million customers were. And post-merger, all we really worried about was 15 Wall Street analysts. And you could just literally plot AOL's downfall to the day of the merger. And so, you know, I was a product, I ran the service, I cared about our customers. And I would say that no one comes to work um, motivated by trying to generate free cash flow so we can pay off cable debt, right? People come to work because they want to work in a company that has a double bottom line. And that, that concept is central in my book. Um, every movie I make or my sports teams, every business I invest in now, they have to have strong double bottom lines. Um, you founded a company, you wanted to get big penetration, you wanted to get good cable fees, you want people to be able to support it and sponsor it, you want the critics to like what you're doing, but you're trying to change the world. You're trying to bring information to lots of people. You're trying to get people to understand how their government functions. And so you created a double bottom line business. And once you over-index one way or the other way too much, businesses get 
out of balance and they don't succeed. There's a, a line here I want to read back to you. You kind of said it now, but um, uh, very quickly we became an inward focused company. We became a company that managed for Wall Street. How, explain what happens. What happened in, in your head when you were a merged company and you were based in Virginia and Time Warner was based in New York? What's managing for Wall Street? Um, you look at what are the financial ramifications of every decision that you're making and your time horizon of goodness is 90 days. It's the next quarter ahead of you as opposed to what is in the best long-term interest of our key stakeholders, our employees, our customers. You start to scrimp a little bit on service. You start to scrimp a little bit on on maybe we don't need this extra content, maybe that's a nice to have. And, and once you start to go down that road where everything is primarily looked at through a financial filter so you can meet a financial analyst's expectation, well, the financial analysts really are a step behind what the consumer wants. And my belief is if you make a great product and you make a great service and you have a good business model and you execute, then Wall Street will report on what your prospects are. But when you start to try and trick or get into cahoots with financial analysts, and, and now, Brian, they have the whisper number. It's no longer good enough just to meet the number. There might be a whisper number that you, and, and you tend to put all of your time and energy around the wrong thing. And, and right now, there's this call to get back to basics. Um, money isn't the product. We, we saw that, what's going on with Goldman Sachs right now. I mean, they were making money a product into itself. Uh, American business operates best when it knows what its customers want, when it makes fantastic and innovative products and services. Consumers will pay for that. And if you have that going, that virtuous cycle, the financials will speak for themselves and then Wall Street can make their bet on you or not. But you talk, though, <clears throat> that, and I read all through this period from the different sides what people felt about each other, but you talk about the arrogance that existed in the New York crowd? Well, I think the traditional media sometimes is very disconnected with mainstream America. Um, I also think that there's an arrogance of America versus the rest of the world. Today, there are 2 billion people online around the world. Only 10% of the world's internet population is here in the United States. Uh, even though we perfected and helped invent the internet, we're a small piece of the overall pie. Um, I, I laud what our government's trying to do right now in making broadband, making connectivity like clean running water, like electricity. We have fallen behind in a game that we invented. If we don't innovate using the internet as the platform for these new services, you, know, you look at, at the, the uptick in the economy uh, and the business around like the iPhone and all of the applications that are coming on the iPhone and the iPad and some of the things that Google is doing. That's still the engine that will drive our economy. And if we don't have the basic power plant, we'll fall behind. And, and so what I saw at Time Warner a little bit is that they liked the world, just like those newspaper editors, they liked the world the way it was. It was good when people weren't provided the tools. And we live in this world the faster, better, cheaper, till it's free. We live in this world where bandwidth and computing power is doubling every 18 months. And so, so that pace of change is so dramatic. And when you're a leader, well, you know, when you own Time Magazine, you don't want there to be a Google. You don't want there to be innovation because that's going to destroy or certainly change the business model that you've developed for the last 20 or 30 years. You left AOL in 2007. Um, you started with List and then Redgate. What was that? Uh, Redgate <laughs> was a new media company that merged with AOL back in 1993. And then AOL, and, and you merged with Time Warner. Yep. And now you've got the sports teams. What else are you doing? I started to make movies. <clears throat> um, I realized that, that movie making helped to exercise the 
creative part of my personality, but also as a way of giving back. I, I ended up coining a term, filmanthropy. Uh, make movies that will get critically acclaimed and win awards and do well in theaters and get bought by the HBOs of the world, but use the medium to ignite change, a perception or, or activate volunteerism or act, activate charitable giving. So I've made three movies. They've all rung high on that double bottom line, won, won an Emmy Award last year. Um, they've all been bought for you know, major broadcast distribution. But what I'm most proud of is that they've been good work kinds of films. They, they've helped shine the light on a tough subject and got people to volunteer or write checks for the charities that they focus on. The first movie you did, a documentary called Nan King. Where'd you get the idea? I was reading the New York Times. I was on vacation and I read an obituary. Um, and, and it was uh, a wonderful um, story about a woman named Iris Chang and how this woman had written a book about a forgotten Holocaust. And I had never seen those two words strung together, a forgotten Holocaust. And, um, and her picture was so, so warm and inviting in, in this article about her. When I came home, I Googled her. I ended up buying the book. And when you go to Amazon, it says, if you like this book, you'll like these books. And there was a couple of books that had just come out, Good Man of Nan King and American Goddess of Nan King. So I bought all three books, and I was absolutely devastated by, by this time in history. But I was, I was shocked by how strong a moral code Westerners, Americans had, and, and how the Chinese worshipped these people as gods and goddesses at a time when Americans were looked at poorly around the world, here was a time in history when, when individuals did the right thing. They, they had moral courage. They, they did things out of the goodness of, of their hearts to help. And now these books were coming out because the China had become more populist and, and open and their stories were being told. And I just felt compelled to tell the this, this story in a movie. Here's an excerpt from your documentary. It's about a minute and a half, and we'll continue to talk about that and also Iris Chang. Fuchin 很热，那个好像有一种热水之声呢，叫的一样。哎呀，我爸爸起来了，飞机冲下来，看着看着一个炸弹就下来了，炸弹炸的那个水里，嘣，这个上面的人呢，统统都都没有了，统统的一起倒
came out were not acknowledging that this time in history really had ever occurred. They, in fact, there's lots of people who are considered deniers. They, they think that the episode was overblown. And so what we did was we went to China. We found 88 living survivors. They're all in their 80s and 90s, and we were able to catalog and interview them. Uh, we also went all over the world and got unbelievable footage. As you saw, we won the editing award at the Sundance Film Festival back in 07. And then we were able to get 12 Hollywood movie stars to bring to life diaries and letters um, that were written by these people who were na in Nanking, China. And it really was unbelievable because uh, you know, there was no email, there, there was no phones, and so there were people who would write in their diaries a hour by hour what they saw, what they heard. And then there was a priest, a minister, who went out and surreptitiously filmed, and so there was an actual film that got smuggled out of the country and brought here uh, via the State Department and shown uh, at the U.S. Capitol. Will you tell us how much you spent on making that Mm -hmm. um, it was a major endeavor. It was almost a couple of million dollars. Get your money back? I don't think I'll ever get my money back, but I've done so well on the other bottom line of uh, bringing, bringing a lot of attention to this time uh, in history. Um, it did very well on HBO. It won an Emmy Award. We won a Peabody Award, and so I've been paid back so many more times than just economically. In 1998, Iris Chang sat there uh, and was interviewed for her book. In 2004, she committed suicide. In 2007, you made this film. I want to go back to, two th to 1998. This is, I want to warn the audience, this is the roughest stuff we've ever, sh I think, shown on this program. But this is from the book notes of 1998 with Iris Chang. That's the photo of a, of a woman who, a rape victim, who is being forced to pose next to a Japanese soldier naked. Um, they found these photos in the wallets of some of the uh, Japanese soldiers. You know, they took them. And sometimes the, the people in the local photo mat would, uh, would, would make copies because they knew how important they were. On the other page at the top, what's that, what's that photo? I still have problems looking at it. That's a woman who's been impaled after she's been raped. Right down here. And where did you find this? Um, this again came came from China. It, it it was it's it's it came from the Chinese archives. And the photo above it? Um, that's a picture of a woman who's been gang raped, and she, as you could see, she's been tied to the chair so that she could be raped um, whenever. The soldiers were in the mood for it, and um, again, I mean, I, I have a hard time even looking at these pictures even now. Can you give us any insight in explaining how human beings do this to one another? Um, well, it's, it is really moving to see Iris. Uh, I become friends with Iris's mother and father, and um, <clears throat> Mrs. Chang is a wonderful woman, and. She believes that um, there was a reason that I read this obituary, and uh, she said Iris had always wanted to make a high-quality film because you can't really tell this story just in print and in black and white photographs. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's anything positive when an army invades and occupies a city and um, basically takes for hostage um, young men and women and... Um, and the Japanese were using China really as a launching pad for World War II. And there was a deep generationally distrust between the Chinese and the Japanese. Nanking was the capital of China at the time. Ironically, that that city fell, um, it was very embarrassing to the Chinese. In fact, when the people's army was created afterwards, China, one of the reasons China is such a strong, singular nation right now is what happened then. There was kind of a, a vow that why would we ever let a smaller nation like a Japan be able to come in and overrun and occupy our country. And so they look at the rape of Nanking 
not unlike um, um, Israel looks at the Holocaust, you know, never again, and they fortified themselves, and, you know, they have one of the strongest militaries now, and something like that could never happen in China. Uh, the Wikipedia site on Iris Chang has uh, three notes that she wrote, uh, or suicide notes, on November the 8th, 2004. And the second one I wanted to read back to you because, it, um, again, based on your book, you might be able to give us some insight because here's a woman that saw all this, spent all this time with, talked about it, uh, and she ended up shooting, killing herself with a gun. Uh, she wrote this on the day she, uh, I think the day before she shot herself. When you believe you have a future, and by the way, she had had a nervous breakdown in, in near Louisville uh, yep. bef time before that. When you believe you have a future, you think in terms of generations and years. When you do not, you live not just by the day, but by the minute. It is far better that you remember me as I was in my heyday as a best-selling author, said Iris Chang, than the wild-eyed wreck who returned from Louisville. Each breath is becoming difficult for me to take. The anxiety can be compared to drowning in an open sea. I know that my actions will transfer some of this pain to others, indeed those who love me the most. Please forgive me. Forgive me because I cannot forgive myself. Um, well, certainly she was deeply troubled. Um, I mean, equally as sad. Um, one of the heroes in the movie and in Iris's book was um, a woman from Ohio named Minnie Vatran. And Vinny, uh, when he saved the lives, Minnie Vatran's an unbeliever. She's called the American goddess of Nanking. She saved the lives of 15,000 young women. Um, this group of Westerners banded together and created a safe zone and a credit with saving a couple of hundred thousand people. When she came home, when they finally liberated Nanking and she came home, she too took her own life. And in her notes, it was, I wish I had been able to do more. And, and it's a very, very tough time in history. It, and it shows, you know, it, I, I looked at my movie, it's almost an anti-war film. There's no right or wrong, but, but it shows that bad things happen to innocent civilians when a nation occupies that city. Here's some more, about another minute and a half from your documentary, Nan King. もう it's not until we tour the city that we learn the extent of the destruction. We come across corpses every 100 or 200 yards. The bodies of civilians that I examined had bullet holes in the backs. These people had presumably been fleeing and were shot from behind. Were you surprised that the Japanese participated in your documentary? Um, well, those are some soldiers who were actually there, and some of them have since passed on, and I think it was a end of the life, getting some things off of their chest. Um, what we wanted to do with the movie, and we were able to do successfully, is we as filmmakers didn't want to have a point of view. Uh, we just talked to survivors, to soldiers who were there, and read verbatim from the diaries and brought all of that together with pictures and videos. And 
you know, I'll be honest, I, I had some threats against me by some right-wing Japanese, and there were some protests, and, you know, they'd say there weren't 21,000 women who were raped. Uh, and I'd say, okay, how many were raped? And they'd say, well, less. And it's okay, how many? 15,000? 13,000? I mean, is that okay? And, and, and so I understand what happened to poor Iris Chang. She broke the news, if you will, with this book. And, and she was ridiculed mercilessly about, well, that picture that you say happened in this city on this day, it didn't. Um, it, it couldn't have been in November because look at the way the sun is setting. And so if this picture is dated wrong, then that must mean the rest of the posits in your book must be wrong. And she, she took it personally that she was kind of on trial in this court of public opinion. Her suicide, was, was there any, talking to her parents, was there any evidence that she had depression before all this started? Um, I do believe that she had some depression and if you were around this subject matter for enough, I mean, you could see how it would really add to a, to a darkness and an ennui that would set in because it's a horrible part of life. What my movie tried to show, though, was that even in the darkest times, there's light. Even in the most gruesome times, and, and, and the Westerners who stayed behind were great heroes, as well as many of the Chinese who stayed behind and banded together. And, and that's at really what at the heart of my book, um, being part of a community, um, finding the higher calling, um, volunteering and giving back, getting out of the I and serving a collective we, those are all traits that make for happiness and self-actualization. And every one of those Westerners, Woody, Woody Harrelson plays the role, or reads the, the diaries of a Harvard Medical School uh, trained um, doctor who was worked in Nanking. If Americans leave, a great many of the Chinese would go also. The hospital would have to close or be operated by military authorities. One can't help feeling that leaving right now would be passing up an opportunity for service of the highest kind. The U.S. government said boats and, and trains to get everyone out, and these 12 people stayed behind. And he writes this beautiful letter home to his wife and says, I, I can't come home, I know I should, but I'll never be able to look in the mirror knowing that I left and I left people behind to die unnecessarily. And you as my wife wouldn't love me knowing that I was less of a man than you thought you had married. And, and, and so those were the kinds of um, episodes that we wanted to dwell on and that if you do the right thing the right way, you'll become self-actualized, you'll be happy. And in this case, these people were heroes and their stories had never been told. Now you can watch this uh, documentary free uh, on something called snagfilms.com. Yeah, I made, started to make documentaries and I realized that there are so many great and talented filmmakers. Uh, they'll make these wonderful good work movies, but there aren't movie theaters that will show them. You know, they'd rather show Batman and Superman and and Transformers, and, and so these good work films sometimes don't reach a wide audience. So knowing a lot about the internet and using this concept of filmanthropy, that people want to do good, they want to self-express. So I created a new business called snagfilms.com. It's booming, it's doing great. We have a couple of thousand free movies. You can go watch movies like Nang King, like, like another one of my films called Kicking It, like Super Size Me, like Hoop Dreams, really great films. And then if you like the movie, you can snag it, and then you can drag it and embed it onto your blog or your Facebook page or your website and let your audience watch the movie. And now we have about 80,000 virtual movie theaters open. We reach a couple of hundred million people every month. We're streaming 15, 20 million movies per month. 
and we sell advertising in it and we give half the ad revenue to the filmmaker so they're getting revenues but we work with every filmmaker to pick a charity that they want to support and we embed that charity right into the movie and so we are supporting about 455 charities right now and so I'm very proud of it in that I think it's going to be a big business it's going to to have lots of revenues and lots of traffic but we're going to support a lot of charities and we're going to help filmmakers to break through that only 500 movie theaters will show independent movies Al Gore's movie An Inconvenient Truth was in 500 movie theaters he won the Nobel Prize and won an Oscar but not a lot of people saw it now this will become kind of the YouTube if you will for good work movies Mark Cuban has some theaters called Landmark Theaters uh, he owns the Dallas Mavericks, and you can see him about as often as you can see you in the sports world. <laughs> yep. What is it about you sports guys that uh, sports come first or these movies come first? Well, I think, um, I think what happens is that you make your wealth in a field of endeavor like high technology. Mine was America Online. Uh, Mark sold the company to Yahoo and made a lot of money. Uh, you buy sports teams, one, because they're a lot of fun, and two, they're such important local assets. Um, nothing brings a city closer together than a winning sports team. We're seeing that now with the Washington Capitals. It's also a platform to give back. Um, we support so many charities. Our players support so many charities, and so it in itself is a double bottom line business. Um, I started to make movies, uh, and I'll only make good work movies. I'll only make films as a philanthropist. I don't want to make Transformers 3. I want to give back, and I, I like exercising the creative part of my personality through filmmaking or writing books. Where'd you get the name Snag Films? Uh, from the actual action of if you're watching the movie and you like it, you can snag it and drag it and embed it into your website and open a virtual movie theater. Where is the company based? Uh, it's here in Washington, D.C., as well as Tribeca in New York. And how many people work there? Uh, there's a couple of dozen people right now. It's growing really, really fast. Steve Case, uh, uh, who is the founder of AOL, he's one of the investors in it. And, um, you know, our goal is to make this really the one-stop shop for independent film and documentary film and really be the filmmaker's best friend and if we can do that and bring these good work films to the widest audience possible around the world we think we'll not only be contributing to society as a whole but we're going to build a really big scalable business. Over the history of documentaries most of them uh, almost an overwhelming number have been done by left of center people. Um, I think that that's because a lot of foundations will fund them and many of the foundations perhaps are, are liberal. I, I think what you're seeing though now is that reality television and YouTube documentary as a way of expressing is becoming second nature to young adults. And I think you'll see lots of students, I know my son is at University of Pennsylvania right now, they teach you to express using video because bandwidth is so available and the cost of production is going down so low and movie making the cost of it because you can shoot in HD is going so low. So I think we will see short form and documentary film becoming very, very popular with young people as they enter the workforce and that we're going to see an explosion of views, left, center, right, business, uh, charity, all using this medium as a way to get their message out. What's been the most watched documentary you put on Snag Films? Um, well, we've had some that have gotten millions and millions of hits. We, we just had one uh, to start baseball season called Fantasyland. There was about men who kind of give up their lives and their families because they get so inundated with... Um, with uh, fantasy baseball. Uh, we've, we have films for about disease states, about health. Uh, we had one very moving one about a young man who goes away to college and gets involved in a drinking game in a fraternity and dies. And the mother gets really, really upset, uh, not only because her son died, because she realizes and learns that 3,000 kids, more kids die every year of alcohol poisoning in high school and college that died during 9-11 and she takes it on herself and makes this film called Haze 
uh, Snag Films premiered it, and then we were able to get fraternities and colleges all over the country to show it as a as a as a public service announcement that hey, you can die by overdosing on alcohol, and that fraternity life it's all about drinking and being accepted, and that three thousand kids every year lose their life because of it. Do you buy any of these? or rent any of these documentaries or lease them to put them on your, on your site? Uh, our deal is that we get them for free and then we split the revenue 50-50 and we sell ads and kind of like a cable model, uh, we're getting $25 per thousand um, from you know, great advertisers and advertisers want to run their ad in this high quality content. This isn't YouTube video, this is real highly produced with great directors. The director of Nan King won an Academy Award for the movie Twin Towers, has written books, has directed, you know, many T V shows. I mean these the we they have professional lighting. You know what you're getting as an advertiser. And so you're gonna see sites like Hulu that takes professionally produce television uh, and then sells ads around it and distributes it online and snag films. I think those are two good precursors of what media will look like over the next 10 years. Can you give us any idea what a, a, a year in revenues is? Um, We'll probably do this year a little under $10 million. Uh, we'll be profitable probably in our third quarter of this year, so seven quarters of of investment and then it'll become profitable. What's the long term uh, uh, prediction? For me, I would like to get a million virtual movie theaters open. I think um, getting a billion pixels donated by consumers where they can distribute. Um, we, we You hear a lot in this business about user generated content like YouTube. Uh, I think a next trend is you're going to see user uh, distributed content and that that um, consumers now, you know, I, I'm on Facebook, I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook, I can take a movie that's important to me, put it into what's called my Facebook news feed, my 5,000 friends can get an alert that says, oh, there's this cool new film, Ted really liked it, you ought to watch it. And I think that that's a trend and that you can bring video that way and get distributed and get your message out, I think is something that will bear watching. Recently, uh, in the middle of your um, hockey playoffs, you wrote a blog that I read. Your blog's called Ted Ted's Take. Ted's Take, uh, and you just talked about a Saturday morning when you were floating through your life, and everywhere you went, people had some remarks to make to you about the hockey team. And I kept thinking, why does he want this? I mean, there weren't a lot of them weren't saying nice things to you because you lost the day before. Well, I think it goes to show how important a sports team is to the psyche of your community. Um, suddenly when the Redskins win on Sunday, Monday is a happy day in Washington, D.C. that our team has been doing so well. And, and I think that's a big responsibility. Um, I don't just want our team to make the playoffs. I don't even want our team just to win a Stanley Cup. I want to make millions and millions of lifelong memories between fathers and sons and mothers and daughters. I want immortality for our team. You get your name etched in the Stanley Cup. Um, nothing brings a city closer together than a winning sports team. I, I grew up in New York in the in the 60s. I'm an only I'm an only child and my dad used to take me to Jets games and I remember the Jets winning the Super Bowl with Joe Namath and my dad and I watching that game on TV and hugging and crying. And now we fast forward 40 years. My father passed away a couple of years ago. And um, last November, the Colts and the Jets were playing again in the playoffs. And on the NFL channel, they were running that Super Bowl. And I was on the treadmill exercise and I was watching the game. And I had to get off the treadmill the memories of me and my dad, my growing up, holding his hand, walking into that stadium, just came flooding back to me. And it was very humbling because like, that's the business I'm in. I'm, I'm in a business when you own a sports team where you can create a memory that 40 years later can make a grown man cry. And so I, I view owning a sports team, it's a public trust. You have the psychological well-being of millions of people in the palm of your hand. 
And I think it's no different than being a politician, that or being a mayor. I was mayor of my town in, in Florida for a while, and you feel that you're there to represent a large collection of people and hold the mirror up to them, and that's what I think owning a sports team is all about. You were the mayor of Vero Beach? Uh, Orchid, Florida. <laughs> Don't you still have a place in Vero Beach? I do. We go to Vero Beach. We love it down there, and we spend some weekends and holidays there. Now, the thing that's one of the things missing from your book is it, there are no pictures of your family or any pictures in there. Why is that? Um, well, it just wasn't that kind of book, and my wife I, likes a little bit of privacy, and, and so my picture was on the cover. I, I think we all thought that was enough. What is your prediction as to the future, the, the things that you've been talking about here will be on politics in this country? Um, I think that the country right now um, is growing further and further apart from its government. We're seeing that with the teabaggers. We're seeing that with our president who came in with such promise already having fallen popularity. And I think a big reason for that is that these intermediaries, the media, you know, what C-SPAN was so brilliant of was you don't need an editor or a filter to form your own opinion. You should be able to watch and listen unabashedly to what is being done and read and said. That was your founding premise of C-SPAN. Well, more and more in this new media, we need to have direct connection with those that serve us. Um, I read all of my emails. Uh, I get three, 400 emails per day. I've done every job at the arena. I'm on Facebook. I blog three, four, five times a day. I read all of the comments. I'm intimate with what is happening. And, and what I see sometimes is when you campaign for office, you really are with the people. And then you get elected and you go into these hallowed halls and you have all of this security and you start to have what I call the theory of nines. Um, you're a 10 and you get elected and then you have a nine who becomes your chief of staff and then he hires eights and then they bring in sevens and before you know it, it's the fours, the people that are really you didn't elect, you didn't don't want serving you who are running the country. And, and I really think that because now the media and the steering wheel is in the hands of the consumer, that there needs to be a much higher empathy and listening more to what the community at large really wants. And I think sometimes we in Washington or in New York, the high priests in media, we tune out who our consumer is, and we start to listen to this, these vital few people that all have their points of view. And as you well know, D.C. is like no other city in the world. It's very, very disconnected from what's happening in Kansas City. And the media people in New York are very, very disconnected many times to you know, the rest of the country. The book is called The Business of Happiness. Our guest is Ted Leonsis, and I thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. It was an honor to be here, and really great to meet you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Tomorrow on Washington Journal, Jack Coleman.